I was approached by an American TV producer called Ben Silverman. He had a small production company called Revlay. And he asked me over lunch whether it was possible, whether I thought it was even conceivable to turn the Tudor dynasty into a, a soap opera for TV. So my initial response was uh, no, that that was impossible. But it was a long lunch. And by the early evening, I was mellowing. And I thought it was possible uh, that it might be uh, done like that. But I wanted some, some help from him about the kind of standard that one would aspire to. And because uh, I'd never written for TV before. And very cleverly, he sent me a lot of uh, scripts of the West Wing. So I realized this was very serious and, and that I had to uh, uh, aspire to, be, uh, to write as well as the, the writers of, of, of that show. Um, of course, I'd done a lot of research um, into the Tudor period and the Elizabethan period. I'd written a, a, a movie called uh, Elizabeth. And, uh, but I wanted a new Henry. If it was worth doing, it would have to be different. It would have to show the Tudor court. It would have to show the king in a different way. Of course, there's a cliche about Henry, is that he's a big, fat, bearded fellow eating chicken wings, uh, belching and, and cutting his wife's head, heads off. And uh, I knew from uh, my reading that this wasn't the whole picture. And it seemed more exciting to do uh, a younger Henry. Uh, I know that be, his father had started the dynasty, but we're still at the, the, more or less at the beginning of the Tudor dynasty, that he's one of the most famous monarchs. But in fact, uh, people, generally speaking, don't know a lot about him. The more I read, the more uh, obsessed I became with him and his court, and the more sure I became that uh, not only did we have a possibility of a, of a series here, but that we would be showing things that people had never seen before and probably wouldn't believe even if we showed them. I wanted it to have contemporary resonances. Too often when we deal with, uh, they make shows of historical or so-called historical material, they're like museum pieces. Uh, you don't uh, believe that these are flesh and blood. Well, they may be interesting characters, but you don't uh, associate with them and you don't associate with their issues and problems. It was very clear to me, uh, as I say, from, from the inception, that I wanted something that would resonate to a contemporary and an American uh, audience. Even if um, my uh, view of Henry and my view of the period might uh, exercise some uh, English historians who have a proprietorial interest in, in Henry and Elizabeth uh, and, and believe that there is only one way to, to, to show him, and, and this uh, clearly wasn't true. And I think through the show and through um, the investment of the actors uh, living and breathing these characters that we've uh, hopefully succeeded in bringing uh, a period to life so that, uh, as I say, specifically Americans who, who might go to a, a sort of a heritage trail through, through the great houses of England and Hampton Court Palace won't anymore have the same idea of, of Henry being some distant, unknown, um, unknowable person, that he was very real, uh, he was young once, he was in love, he had issues about divorce and money, uh, like everyone else does. And uh, it was a huge attempt to make it real, to make it identifiable uh, and sympathetic and, and, and real and human. So here's a man who can do anything. He has everything. He can do everything. He's young, athletic, handsome, healthy. He's the best at most of the things he, he does. So I think that is a premise. That is an exciting premise. What did he do with it? What could he have done? For young men watching the program, it's a, you know, a premise they might be interested in juggling with themselves. If you had absolute God-given power, how would you use it? And of course, one of the things that uh, screws him up is love, uh, as happens in, in most people's lives. Uh, 
but again, it was the idea, too, of modernity, of creating characters who were not distanced in time, but right in your face, and that you could talk to. It's been an exciting part of my life to be both an executive producer and the writer. Normally, the writer is not welcome on a film set um, for various reasons. And of course, as, as is often pointed out on a film set, the director is God. And uh, it was nice to hear that uh, on a TV series, the writer is God. Although I've had to say from Time to time I've pointed out that for, for God I've been given a pretty poor car to drive around in. But um, when you first see people in costume and you first uh, hear them saying your words, it's a time of fundamental fear and panic. And what is going through your head is, oh God, it may be no good. You think, is it going to be embarrassing? Are the actors going to be embarrassed by having to say your words? And then it's not immediate, but slowly you realise that they can say it, that they can invest it with their own personalities, and that it's not too bad. It's not too bad that all the years you've spent practising writing has probably paid off a little, and that some of the lines, at least, uh, are worth saying are good. And it's, for me, it's been a, a thing that I've been able to relax. Uh, Really, never before has this happened that uh, I can now watch them saying without self-consciousness, they have taken the characters on from, from where I left off. They have imbued the characters with flesh and blood and their own personalities. And, of course, you get to a stage when you suddenly realise that some of the actors are behaving more like their characters than like themselves, and then you know you've, you're onto something. Uh, so yes, it starts with panic and emptiness, but it ends with love. I think nobody has shown Henry as a young man because of the iconography. Yeah. I remember when we started Elizabeth, we were turned down by several actresses who said that Glenda Jackson had done the definitive role and that you couldn't do it again. And again, people had an iconic view of Elizabeth. Uh, now, there are many Elizabeths, but at the time, People uh, viewed it with, uh, us with suspicion that we were going to do something to their favourite icon, that it was a kind of blasphemy to uh, humanise uh, a goddess, basically. Henry, the same thing, I think, because he's an icon, he's a, and we see him in a certain way, there is a kind of uh, nervousness about showing him in other ways. And, I'm absolutely sure there's going to be a reaction, not in America, but in England, to this betrayal. It's as if, no, Henry VIII was never like that. He was never a, a, a young man. There were no, you know, even though you read it in the history books, and it's true, and I, I'd like to say that, that, that I would... It's impossible to say absolutely, but the show is, is grounded on historical fact, or what passes for historical fact. It's in history books. Um, uh, uh, but it's as if there's a sort of collective amnesia. It's as, it's as if people don't want to, you know, never thought of it. And, you know, this is a sort of wake-up call and, you know, hey, we can do this. And it's fascinating. I mean, to me, the more I read, the more fascinating and extreme and extraordinary this story or these interrelated stories were. And uh, it may be that before now, no one's found a lever to move it with. No one's found the st what is the story inside it. I uh, found, I thought that the, the story initially was in the struggle between um, Henry Catherine and Anne Boleyn before the divorce, for the face of the country, for the future of England. And the more I got into it, the more certain I became that that was a solid beginning. And um, we chose Johnson, uh, Rhys Myers, and he chose us, and it's been a wonderful marriage. Jonathan uh, is everything uh, that was on the page that I'd written, but he brings so much uh, more than that. 
And I feel in many ways that he's an instinctual Henry. I think Henry was like Jonathan, and that Jonathan is like Henry as a, a young man. There is the same uh, virility, the same energy, uh, the same challenging of limitations. The thing that Henry is, he refused to accept any limitations. And in his acting, uh, Jonathan's the same, uh, extremely uh, bold. Uh, and other aspects, uh, and attractive, uh, uh, and, and youthful, and uh, clever, all the things that, 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 that Henry was. Sam Neill plays Wolsey as uh, an urbane, thoughtful, manipulative, interesting, complex man. Sam is a great actor, and he's brought uh, depth to the characterization. And his characterization, I think, deepens as, they, as the series goes on, and you see the interrelation between Woolsey and Henry. And I hope that in this characterization, what Sam has managed to do is invest Woolsey with a great deal of sympathy, that at last you understand the burdens that this man carried, at last you understand him as a human being, and his fall is tragic. His fall is, is, is tragic in many, many ways, many ways that Woolsey himself feared and presaged about what would happen to England after he was gone. Uh, Sam has uh, amazed uh, and delighted me, and he, um, I can't imagine uh, that we could have had a better Woolsey. Jeremy Norton plays Thomas More, who again is an iconic figure in English history. I would say that as opposed to Woolsey, most English people think rather kindly of More, of course we saw him portrayed in The Man for All Seasons. Uh, he's always being thought of as, as serious, as a humanist who's interested in uh, ideas and uh, in uh, exploring human potentials, that we know he encouraged his daughters to be educated. And on the whole, we view him, uh, he was of course sainted uh, later on, we view him very sympathetically. I think that in the series we're getting closer through Jeremy's portrayal to a truer picture of Thomas More. More was much more complex. More did encourage his daughters to be educated. At the same time, he burned heretics. He was a man of the most devout faith, and for that faith, he died. He was prepared to die. But he was also prepared to burn, stand and watch other human beings being burnt. He was very inflexible. And he was extreme in some respects. He was much more intellectual than Woolsey, uh, but he even shocked uh, his mentor, humanist mentor Erasmus, with the, the clinical, the clinical, the severity of his beliefs. So I think that we have a great portrayal, another great actor uh, playing more and getting out of the character many more of the complexities. I thought that Natalie Dormer had an almost impossible job. Anne Boleyn is an extremely difficult person to do justice to and portray. And we chose someone to play her who was uh, inexperienced, and who'd never certainly tackled a role of this size. And uh, one of the difficulties of playing someone like Anne Boleyn is all the baggage that comes with the name. Uh, Anne Boleyn is not a popular figure, even in a, a, a Protestant country like England. She is forever the other woman. She was regarded as much at the time, and there still hovers over her the sense to class-ridden English people that she wasn't uh, the right class, that she was a commoner, that she usurped the position of a great queen, and that uh, Henry beheaded her uh, and, and fell out of love with her because she couldn't produce a, a, a male son. So it's and one of the things I was very keen to do was to make her complex and sympathetic, to understand her point of view, where she was coming from, her issues. She was pushed 
by her uncle Norfolk and her father, who's a very devious manipulator, into uh, flirting with, uh, falling in love with Henry, uh, and the idea that she kept him on a string for about seven years uh, causes sort of gasps of uh, astonishment and frustration amongst uh, many people. Uh, but I think that she genuinely fell in love with him, and I think this is a genuine love story. And I think that the passion that Natalie has brought to it uh, really uh, sets it up. Uh, it's extraordinary to see this, the, 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 the triangle of Catherine of Aragon, the gracious, the, the great queen, and uh, Anne Boleyn, the young, intelligent, passionate woman, who, both of whom are in love with Henry.